So I'm David. Uh, I am currently a British citizen. Uh, I have always been in love with continental Europe. I lived in France for a year. I find as many opportunities as I can to go to continental Europe to all sorts of interesting places, including Austria, uh, Denmark and Albania. And so I'm currently applying for Irish citizenship so I can carry on doing that after Brexit. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm contractually obliged to explain that the reason why I'm talking to you uh, today is to talk to you about the uh, United Nations Declaration on Human Rights, which is just over 70 years old. So, so having got that out of the way, um, I suspect that uh, you will have one of these two views, or you will be familiar with one of these two views, some of you will think there are lots of things that have been achieved in the name of human rights. And that human rights is a, uh, a good thing and are a bandwagon that Christians can seek to steer and at least can endorse. Others of you will think there are some things that have been promoted through the use of human rights uh, that are dangerous uh, and appear to be anti-Christian and uh, actually seek to undermine human flourishing. And this can lead to a suspicion that the language of human rights and the use of human rights as, as a tool and as a way for, for capturing particular types of injustice uh, actually lead to all sorts of problems. Uh, you can tell a story of human rights and you can run that slide from top to bottom or you can run it from bottom to top. So if we take it from the top, the idea of freedom of religion that found its way into the uh, US Constitution uh, because of that interesting combination of Baptists, I am one, Deists, I'm not, I'm a theist, um, actually has its roots back in the Reformation. A and if you were listening to Michael Reeve last night, that emphasis on conversion, a change of heart, Heart being essential to authentic Christian faith was one of the things that Luther and Calvin and the other reformers discovered. And so once you say that your religion is not just something you are born with, but it is something that you have to choose to make real and fundamental to your own identity, then the question becomes... Why on earth should you let the state decide what is true and what is false in matters of religion? Because if you let the state decide what is true and what is false in terms of matters of religion, well, guess what? Rulers tend to pick versions of religion that say, you must obey the ruler no matter what. You must sacrifice to the ruler. You must treat the ruler as godlike. Yeah, you see that, that's what the ancient pharaohs did, that's what the ancient Babylonians did, it's what the communists did in uh, the Soviet Union. You see this tendency throughout history. Whereas if you say, well actually, religion is about a relationship with God. It's about knowing that you are saved personally. Well that comes from the inside and therefore, actually, uh, not only do rulers tend to be bad religions, but actually the most that state enforcement of religion can do is hypocrisy. The most that it can do is to produce Pharisees. People who do the right things on the outside, but may think something completely different on the inside. Now, that idea of freedom of religion plugs in to the thinking of John Locke. Now, John Locke has had several name checks. He was undoubtedly massively influential on uh, the founding fathers in the US. Um, and I think found, uh, massively influ influential in the US on all sides. Because Locke is a really tricky and problematic figure. Trying to nail Locke down is tricky. So Locke went to university, at the University of Oxford, where he was in Christchurch, where John Owen, the great Puritan preacher, was the dean in charge of the college. So jo John Owen is teaching John Locke. 
And John Locke, at one of his key points in his argument for religious toleration, makes the point about hypocrisy and about the importance and the essential nature of spiritual truth and a spiritual understanding for true religion. But Locke in his day did not like the Quakers and others that we might regard as sort of Pentecostal uh, in their kind of approach to truth. Uh, he did not like the idea of um, people claiming a personal experience that couldn't be verified. He thought the only evidence that for truth or otherwise about anything was something that could be replicated and produced scientifically again and again. So Locke argues for um, freedom of religion, but he's cautious about religion. And he did something else as well. He published anonymously a book called The Reasonableness of Christianity. Now, when you read that, he basically breaks down Christianity and says, all you need to do to be a Christian is to believe that Jesus is the Messiah. And basically, he thinks there ought to be a broad church which anybody who says Jesus is the Messiah can belong to and that will do you as your kind of Benjamin Franklin's public religion or your Rousseau's civil religion. And the question mark that remains over Locke is this. Does he think the only thing you can establish rationally using the criteria of evidence that he's set himself is that Jesus is the Messiah? Or is he actually a full-blooded Christian who believes that Jesus is the Son of God who came and died and saved humanity through his death and resurrection. I, I'm looking forward to hearing Fred's view on that. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to ask him now, I'm going to give him notice of that question so he can have a think about it. Um, but where Locke is really important is he says, let's imagine that we didn't have a government at all. If we didn't have a government at all, we would all enjoy certain rights. He calls them natural rights. A and that these rights that we enjoy in a state of nature, in a position where there is no government, well, we might look at them and say, well, actually, you know, my, my nice little farm with its picket fence is great until somebody a bit stronger comes along and kicks me off the land. So it makes sense rationally for me to get together with other people who have little farms with picket fences around them and for us to form an association for common defence. And so he builds up the idea of the state on the basis of what do people need to defend their natural rights. What would it be rational for us to agree to delegate to a public agency? And when he starts from that premise, he says, well, it wouldn't be rational for us to delegate our right to freedom of religion that should be no, no concern of the state whatsoever. And in relation to the other rights that exist, the job of the state is to protect our rights. Now those rights for Locke are rights that we have because of our dignity as human beings made in the image of God. One of the great embarrassments for secularists who want to claim Locke as a philosopher of the Enlightenment who has nothing to do with Christianity is that Locke's arguments for the fundamental equality and dignity of human beings all come from the Bible. I mean, they all come from the Bible. It's not like Aquinas where you can take his ideas and you can say, well, that's good, the Aristotle stuff and that's the Bible stuff and we can possibly, if we need to, dissect the two so we're left with some secular crust that, that might just work on its own. There are literally no arguments for human equality in Locke's work do not come from the Bible. Now, that is not a controversial statement amongst academics. Jeremy Waldron's book, God, Locke and Equality, establishes the thesis. I have not come across a single secular academic who argues to the contrary. Locke's understanding of human dignity and human equality is founded on biblical truth, period. Now, around the same kind of time uh, that Locke is writing, there is a massive war waging all across continental Europe called the Thirty Years' War. Uh, the British didn't get involved in that main, uh, mainly because ourselves, the English, the Scottish, the Irish and the Welsh were having our own civil war at the same time. Um, but the Thirty Years' War was the most devastating war to hit 
Europe before the First World War. And the end of the Thirty Years' War led to something called the Treaty of Westphalia, where there was an agreement that uh, different states would have different, promote different forms of Christianity, and that uh, basically we wouldn't go to war over religion anymore. But the most horrendous atrocities had happened during that Thirty Years' War. And so there was a guy in um, uh, the Netherlands called Hugo Grotius, uh, who had to go into exile because he was on the wrong side of a, a theological argument that was going on uh, in, in the Netherlands. And he sat down to think about how we might defend the idea that we ought to treat one another reasonably and decently and in ways that respect human dignity even when we disagree about matters that we see as most fundamental. And he wrote a massive book called The Law of War and Peace. I read the student version, which had all the classical references and all the biblical references cut out. It was still 450 pages long. But just at one point in his argument, he says... Anybody who believes in God ought to realise that human beings are made in the image of God and we ought to treat one another decently and with dignity and respect. And this would still be true, even if there is no God. Etiam si, we're writing in Latin, etiam si, even if there was no God. <coughs> so Grotius, probably despite his intentions, is seen as the founder of international law, the first person who uh, comes up with the idea that we might be able to establish some sort of secular framework of basic rights that human beings have towards one another. But uh, Grotius is a serious Christian. He wrote a very detailed, um, complicated uh, uh, account of the atonement. Uh, yeah, he's, a, he's a major thinker, thinking seriously, but just trying to work out what do we do? How do I sell this idea that we ought to treat one another with dignity and respect to people who are killing each other and dismembering each other and raping each other and pillaging and burning down each other's towns just because of different understandings of uh, truth and um, power games. So that gives us one stream of um, human rights uh, thinking. There's another stream of human rights thinking. And that other stream of human rights thinking begins with a guy called Thomas Paine. And Thomas Paine was one of the uh, instigators, rabble-rousers, uh, pamphleteers, uh, working very hard to justify uh, the American Revolution. And having justified the American Revolution, he uh, then got very enthusiastic about the French Revolution. Now, the context for the French Revolution is that in the reign of Louis XIV in the 17th century, all the protections that had been in place in France for Protestants and atheists and Jews had been revoked. So, if you wanted to get married in France, you had to get married by a Catholic priest. If you did not go through a Catholic ceremony of marriage, you were not married under French law. That was the position for nearly a hundred years. So, uh, yeah, it, the French church, the Catholic church in France and the French monarchy tied themselves really closely together. Uh, actually, guess what? Guess who becomes a virtual deity? A demigod in this kind of system. Louis XIV, the Sun King, he calls himself. Le Roi Soleil. And you have this idea that the king can touch you and will be able to heal you. There's a really kind of tightly knit set of ideas that are going on there. So when the revolutionaries decide to get rid of the monarchy, they decide to get rid of the Catholic Church as well. And so both go, and it is neither God nor master, is the declaration. We ourselves are going to come up with the idea of the rights of man. 
By the way, please note uh, the women in the audience uh, uh, that uh, in both cases for Locke, no, for Locke, it wasn't the rights of man. For Locke, in practice, it was the rights of man, but in theory, men and women were of equal status. Uh, for Paine, well, again, he wrote the rights of man. Mary Wollstonecroft then wrote uh, the rights of women, uh, arguing for a rather different understanding of society. But what Locke delivered in practice was human rights for rich white men. And he delivered that in practice in two ways. One, key to Locke's uh, thinking is the idea of rights thought of as property. Ownership. Uh, and secondly, uh, Locke had a pretty large hand in um, some constitutions for the Carolinas and other slave-owning states um, in the, the USA, uh, as it wasn't then. A, uh, but that's what's going on. Now, with the French Revolution, what you get actually is a reversal of the idea of Louis XIV as the Sun King. So Louis XIV sees himself as the sovereign individual. L'état c'est moi is one of his, the statements attributed to me. The state is me. He's the, he's the guy with absolute power, answerable to nobody on earth. And what the revolution does is simply flip that through 180 degrees. So we now get the individual citizens as sovereigns. And pain really drives this kind of thing home. Formation of society for pain was a choice made by free individuals. So the natural rights people bring with them into society are rights that act as one chooses, free from coercion. Politics in this view is fundamentally an arena for the exercise of choice and our only real political obligations are to respect the freedom and choices of others. Now, that's the analysis of Paine's thinking uh, by an American commentator called Yuval Levine in a, a brilliant book called The Great Debate, uh, which looks at the, uh, how Thomas Paine had fallen out with Edmund Burke. But let me quote you we, uh, a letter that um, Paine wrote to Thomas Jefferson. He explains his idea like this. Imagine 20 people who are strangers to each other meeting in an empty country. Each would be a sovereign in his own natural right. His will would be law, but his power inadequate to his right. You see? The sovereignty of the state, the big guy at the top, has now become the sovereignty of every individual citizen. He then goes on in his, his pamphlet, influential pamphlet, The Rights of Man, society grants the citizen nothing. Every man is a proprietor in society and draws on the capital as a matter of right. We're individuals. We owe nobody anything else. Uh, choice is the only justification for power. Ringing any bells? So, so, so a lot of the things that are kind of coming out and underlying this kind of power, the rhetoric that seems so powerful in our context about choice and individualism and so on and so forth, it's not new. It goes right back to the 18th century and the Enlightenment. Now, what happens after that is that the idea of rights goes into eclipse. The idea of rights goes into eclipse uh, because uh, Jeremy Bentham, the utilitarian philosopher who was very influential in the 18th and 19th centuries in, uh, uh, in Britain, he described rights as nonsense and natural rights as nonsense on stilts. <laughs> and so we go with an idea through those centuries that what matters is that which delivers the greatest happiness for the greatest number. Now, the problem with an idea that says, let's deliver the greatest happiness for the greatest number, is that if most people in your society are going to be happy that the Roma and the Jews and the homosexuals are sent to concentration camps, and you can persuade yourself that there are enough people who will be happy about that, and their marginal happiness outweighs what's happening to the people whose rights are being denied, there is nothing in theory... Nothing in our political theory to stop you doing that. So that's what happened. And if you get rid of the idea there are any absolute standards, 
Any fun, anything fundamental to the state, well then it comes down to what the state decides the law is. What is right is what the state decides the law is. So a state which has sat there and purported to think about it and come up with these ideas could do those kinds of things. And what happened through the later 19th century and the first half of the 20th century was that the fruit of these ideas, well, utilitarianism, its greatest happiness is the greatest number that matters, and positivism, which says law is simply about what is declared by the state to be law, led us to Auschwitz. Now, here in Wieswar, we're an hour, hour and a half away from Auschwitz. I've been coming to this conference for many years. I've been to Auschwitz twice. There are no words. You go and you see people who were tattooed with a number when they went through the door. Never referred to by their name anymore. Their families were split apart. Their hair was shaved. Their clothes were taken off them. It's almost as if every single one of the good gifts that God has given, life, liberty, dignity, the ability to do rewarding work, the ability to engage in meaningful relationships, all those things that are given to humanity in Genesis were systematically, me mechanically, technologically, demonically stripped away from people who went through the doors there. And over a million of them never came out. And if the Nazis had finished with the final solution and wiped out the Jews as they were intending to do, the Slavs were next. The Russians and the Poles and the Ukrainians were next on the list because they were going to carry on with that kind of idea. And so it was in the face of that kind of horror and brutality that the United Nations got together and by now, not only were people aware of what had happened in the death camps and the concentration camps in Nazi Germany, um, the stories were just beginning to come out about what was going on in Stalin's Russia as well. About uh, the, the gulags that were there, about, uh, about uh, some of the ways in which Ukrainians had been treated during the Great Famine that had happened in the years before the war. Uh, and... The Iron Curtain was about to fall, but there was a window of opportunity to make sure that these things never happened again. And in the context of that window of opportunity, what they were reaching for was something that they could get people together around. And the idea that they went for was human rights. And the preamble to the UN Declaration of Human Rights that Fred had got up yeah, begins, the peoples of the United Nations have reaffirmed their faith in human rights. And it goes on and tells us this is there in order that we might not re-experience the things that have just happened. And that's clearly a reference to uh, what's been discovered in relation to the Second World War. And so what they wanted was international standards against which governments would be held to account. Now, it's a very interesting book by a guy called um, Samuel Moyne. And Samuel Moyne has written a book called Christian Human Rights. A and in it, he, he basically uh, advances a couple of theses. Um, his first thesis is that Christians were Johnny-come-latelys to the idea of human rights uh, and we signed up for them for strategic purposes in the mid-20th century and really uh, they don't fit with our faith at all. The second idea is that there is a, uh, another way of conceiving of human rights that strips out the Christian influence and that's a better one. Now I think pain is half right. Sorry, mine is half right. He is wrong to think that Christians are Johnny-come-latelys 
to the idea of human rights. The term is new, but the concepts that you need to found human rights, the idea of human dignity, the idea of fundamental human equality, the idea of human worth, the idea that uh, we are made in the image of God, the idea that there are certain ways of flourishing as humanity which are built into creation and that actually all our organisations, all our groups ought to be serving and not destroying and taking the place of. All of that stuff is integral to the Christian story. It's all there. But he is right that there's another way of understanding human rights that is in tension and in contradiction with that. Now let me talk to you about why I think um, we might need an idea of rights. Um, I'm a lawyer and I used to do car crash litigation. And I remember um, dealing with one case where the driver was driving a car on the wrong side of the road at speed, lost control. Car comes off the road it goes into uh, a, a lay-by, a, a parking space at the side of the road. In the parking space at the side of the road, there's a van selling burgers. There are people sat at tables and chairs. There's a three-year-old child running around. He's got a car full of four people. His car goes through the road sign that's marking out the parking place, goes through the tables and chairs, hits the burger van, spins the burger van through 180 degrees. Only one person was injured in that accident. Everybody else heard the car out of control and, and got out of the way, including the child. The only person hurt was the woman who was in the burger van and who broke a couple of ribs. Now, if I want to describe the guilt of the driver, how guilty was he for driving badly? Pretty guilty. Pretty appalling driving. How much harm was caused? By the grace of God, not very much. I did another case. <clears throat> there was a uh, young couple, they'd been out on the beach, uh, enjoying the day, and they were coming back uh, home. There's one road from the beach back to town, and it is full of cars. But that's okay, because they're on a motorbike. So on their motorbike, going past all the stationary cars. And when they get to the corner, turns out, the man on the motorbike is driving a little bit too fast, loses control of the bike, his girlfriend comes off the back of the bike, goes under a car coming in the opposite direction, broke her back, never walk again. How much guilt? Some on his part, but compared to the other driver, not as much. How much harm? Much more harm. So if you are going to capture what is happening in situations where people do things to other people, you don't net just need the idea of guilt. The idea of guilt that we are all familiar with um, recognises our personal responsibility for the things we have done. But it doesn't necessarily map neatly onto the effect of what has happened to the victims. So if you want to take the reality of suffering seriously, you need to understand what it feels like to be on the wrong end of it. So the Christian um, philosopher, American Christian philosopher Nicholas Walterstorff says, I remember going to um, South Africa during the apartheid era. Now Nick Walterstorff's uh, background is uh, Dutch. So when he's going to South Africa during the apartheid era and spending time with the Boers, he, uh, the language that he speaks is close enough to the language that they speak for him to be able to understand them. Uh, and he's coming out of the same church culture as they are. Uh, and they were having this meeting with the, within the Reformed Church in South Africa, and there were white people there from the church and, and black people. And the white people always wanted to talk about better or worse and about how loving they were being towards the black people. And the black people wanted to talk about justice and injustice. 
And he came away thinking that actually the, the, the white guys were sounding great, using this kind of biblical language about love, but actually what they were using was they were using it to disguise the fact that they were not prepared to accept that they were acting unjustly and to count the cost of what it would mean to act justly. So for those of you who've heard me talk yesterday, this is why loving, acting lovingly always requires us to act at least justly, if not more. It's never an excuse for acting less than justly. But rights language is used at the moment because it has trumping force. You know, if I can turn something into a right, then suddenly I've got their rhetorical higher ground. And, and I can use rights language because it slips between morality and law. You know, it doesn't appear to be judgmental, but it is a way of turning uh, my moral claims into legal claims and my legal claims into moral claims. You know, I have a right to an abortion as a legal right, therefore I must have a right to an abortion as a moral right. I want the right to X, so uh, I, yeah, I want a right to an end to left-handed discrimination. By the way, uh, us left-handed people, we are one of the last discriminated minorities on earth. We die on average five years earlier than right-handed people, and that is because of the systematic oppression that you right-handers impose on us in all sorts of subtle ways that just completely dominate uh, and make my life really difficult and tough. Um, we are, of course, on average smarter than you guys. Um, <laughs> so uh, when the AI comes in, uh, I'm going to get a whole load of cheaper in insurance premiums as a result. Um, <laughs> but you see, what you can do with the rights claim, you can make it work for you and, and slide things. But how do we ground these things is one question we have. Where do we find human rights? And the other question is, are they possessions or are they an aspect of our relationships and just to bottom it out for you if we've got one conception of rights that is coming from Locke it, uh, with, which is Christian influenced it will tend to lead to one set of understandings of what rights and if you have another set of rights coming from um, pain it will lead to another understanding of rights and we might put it like this so if you're if you're coming from the sort of christian influenced lockean approach you'd say well freedom for the sincere worship of god is a justification for human rights freedom to live in peace and security uh, picking up on that idea of natural rights uh, is there uh, involvement and service in the common life so the un declaration on human rights contains within it the right to be involved in public service in your country now, our church has got a missionary uh, who's been working in uh, the north of South Sudan, providing primary health care in an area where basically nobody else will go. Her biggest problem in running the hospital there was dealing with the local governor of the province. Because in that province, there are a whole number of different tribes. And the view of the governor of the province was, my, I represent my tribe, and because I'm governor, the privilege of being governor is I can give all the best jobs in the hospital to the people from my tribe. So if you come from a different tribe, you have no right, in his view, to be involved in public service, to be involved in that public hospital. And she had to fight him. She said, no, we're here, we're here to serve the people. What I want to do is I want to make senior positions in this hospital open to people from every tribe that are in this area. I want to make sure that they all feel like this is their hospital and uh, that uh, they're treated fairly. The right to raise a family, the right to enjoy rewarding and pro productive work. That would be a kind of account of human rights based on this kind of understanding of human dignity, human beings made in the image of God. But if you're coming from Paine's point of view, it's about the freedom to choose. And that means free to be free, being free from the claims of God. If I don't think there's a God, that's fine. If I don't want to participate in a church, that's fine. I, I, what, being free from duties to country and to one another. Yeah. Every citizen is a sovereign in his own right. Society grants him nothing. I owe nothing to others. Freedom from the obligations of family life. 
from pain onwards. It's like this strand of individualism that basically says that our relationships are not fundamental to our being. They are accidental. They are things that we can pick up and put down as we choose. Yeah. Think about how different that is from a Christian understanding. I am who I am because I am a child of God. And then under that, because I'm the child of these particular parents, I'm the husband of this particular wife, and the father of these particular children, I relate to these work colleagues. You know, all of that is seen as somehow constituting who I am. Not in pains thinking, that's all just stuff you can pick up and put down as you choose. And then now increasingly, freedom to choose free from any constraints imposed by biology. I can rework my body in the way that I want. I can say I'm a gender that doesn't match with my uh, biological sex. I um, can then say, well, even though I've switched gender, uh, I, I now want fertility treatment. I mean, just all kinds of things there coming out of that different understanding. And those two different understandings go back to two different foundations for rights. For a Christian-inspired understanding of rights, rights are based on human dignity. If you are taking Paine's approach, rights are dependent on the capacity to choose. Now, logically, that means rights only for the choosers. So if you want to understand why the unborn baby gets such a hard time in arguments about abortion, it's because the unborn baby cannot choose. And so on a Paine's conception of rights, until you get to the point that you can choose, you don't count. Which is why I could find you academics who are now arguing for what they call post-birth abortion. Infanticide, by another word. Because until you get to two or three, until you're able to express some indication that you can choose, well, you don't really fit within the group of people that get rights. If we want to stand, uh, yeah, what do we do with people with Alzheimer's and in a coma? Well, again, they don't fit. They don't count. Having lost the capacity to choose, they don't qualify. Now, you may be feeling a bit uncomfortable about that. But that's a driving force at the moment. Now, th there are, to be fair, um, amongst secularists, um, people who take a different understanding. It, uh, and they say, well, hang on, what, what's simply happened here is, is that we've set the bar for capabilities too high. What we really need to do is drop the bar for capabilities a little lower. Um, these tend to be the favorite category uh, candidates for this. Uh, so gorillas, chimpanzees, orangutans, bonobo. Uh, so there were two lawsuits filed in the States on behalf of the Non-Human Rights Association. And the Non-Human Rights Association filed two lawsuits asking for what's called habeas corpus, which is a release from false imprisonment, or unlawful imprisonment. In fact, one was presented on behalf of a gorilla, one was presented on behalf of a chimpanzee. Both of these were being kept as pets by people. And the argument was that if you take the capabilities approach to rights. If you think about the capacity to choose, well, let's face it, these big guys displayed enough of a capacity to choose, better off than some subnormal members of the human species, so they should be released from their unlawful imprisonment. Now, I have a bit of a problem with that, uh, and my main problem with that is it's sizest, because I love these guys. These guys are gibbons. Um, the others are all great apes. Gibbons are small apes. But they share all the essential characteristics of apes. No tail. Um, highly, highly developed social life. Where does it stop? We get rivers being given rights. New Zealand's just done that. Made rivers legal persons. Um, it's actually uh, impossible on a secular approach to give an account of human rights that catches the dignity that all members of the human species have simply because they are human. People with Down syndromes get the rough end of this in particular. 
all the evidence is that people with Down syndrome uh, express levels of happiness and satisfaction with their lives that are greater than those expressed by people who aren't. I watched a program recently with this absolutely amazing 16-year-old wild, wildlife photographer. Got Down syndrome, but he just had an eye for a photo that's absolutely stunning. Yeah, his, his, the photographs he's taken are a real blessing to humanity as a whole. They're just that sharp. But Iceland is about to become perhaps the first country in the world that has nobody with Down syndrome living there because of systematic abortion of everybody who has that condition. You see, what's unique about Jesus is that in a context in which the fundamental equality of human beings was anything but self-evident, he, by his actions, demonstrated an identity and the dignity of everybody. Born in a stable, a refugee in Egypt as a child, a manual worker as a carpenter, a beggar during his public ministry, executed as a criminal in a punishment designed for slaves, somebody who deliberately spoke to the Samaritan, who spoke to the woman caught in adultery, who dealt with the Roman centurion and healed his servant. He just ran through the tick list of all the people at the bottom of the pile. All those people who did not count. All those people whose rights were not recognised or were forfeit under Roman law. And said, they matter, they matter, they matter, they matter, they matter. And then in his great um, sermon about the sheep and the goats... Whatever you have done to the least of these, you have done to me. It is almost impossible for the complacent West to get its head round how unself evident the idea of fundamental human equality is. We wouldn't have it but for the example of Jesus. You go to India where you have massive caste-based discrimination still going on and you can see what happens. Yeah. One of the lies that um, the New Atheists and others um, tell themselves is that you can hang on to the essential Christian framework or at least the bits they like by chucking God and the contribution of Christianity to Western civilization out of the window. Well, they just need to read more ancient history. If you get how things really were in the Carthage or in Babylon or in the Egyptian Empire or in the Roman Empire before the influence of Christianity, it just looks very, very different. Now, those two different conceptions of rights uh, one coming from capabilities, the other one coming from human dignity, tend to play out in two different understandings of rights. So uh, there's a Canadian um, theorist called Joan Lockwood O'Donovan uh, who wrote and said, look, the problem with the idea of rights is the idea of rights is all about possessive individualism. So the idea of rights, she says, carries with it two things. The idea, one, individuals matter more than community, and two, rights are all about items of property. So it drags this idea of ownership and makes it kind of endemic to a culture. Um, and I thought when I first read her, I thought this is just, that's in interesting, that she might be describing something that's gone wrong rather than something that's integral to the way that human rights are thought about. And then I found uh, an essay written by uh, H.L.A. Hart, who was a great, uh, very influential uh, English legal philosopher in the mid-20th century, called The Concept of Rights. Rights are typically conceived of as possessed by or belonging to individuals. Rights are, in words of one or two syllables, things which belong to me. 
This is his conception. This is a dominant conception of rights in our culture. My body, my rights, my choice. My property, my rights, my choice. That kind of language, endemic to this kind of way of seeing things. And that's what we run up against. People are using rights in this way. Now, if you do that, you simply create a society in which it is a race to assert as many rights as possible and to get as many rights as possible recognised, validated and paid for by somebody else. So this becomes me first, never mind my obligations to others. Me first, never mind the cost of the community. And, and in that situation, when you put up your rights claims like that, well, best way to combat that, it seems, is for me to come up with my own. Well, your rights claims are clashing with my rights claims, and so we get, we get into some sort of trade-off. But here's the problem. Without an underlying conception of what makes for human flourishing, if you try to solve all your disputes simply in terms of the language of rights, you can't solve any of them. Because who decides which right wins? And you end up arbitrating those disputes not on the basis of truth, you end up arbitrating those disputes on the basis of power. My lobbying has been more effective than your lobby lobbying. Um, I mentioned previously uh, that I love um, travelling in Europe and on one occasion I, I had to go and register because I was going to go and live in France for a year and I went to the French Embassy in London and I got allowed to go up the back stairs. I wasn't set up in the lift, I was set up in the back stairs. And so just outside the public bit, by the back stairs was this picture on the wall which says the right to laziness and it's a symbol of a bureaucrat asleep. Uh, I don't just yeah, an in joke amongst the staff at the French Embassy that you know, their commitment to the rights of men and women includes the rights of civil servants to be lazy. I'm sure the civil servants in your country aren't like that at all. But how deep this runs. So we live at the moment where this, uh, the dominant conception of rights is rights conceived of in terms of choice. And we use that as a way of avoiding having any public discussion about what is good. Because the thinking is, we'll disagree about what is good, but we can agree about rights. And so if we can get an agreement about rights, we don't need to worry about what's good. The problem is, we don't agree about rights, so we end up having these proxy discussions. But it doesn't work. So Michael Sandel, Harvard professor, um, famous for his Socratic method of teaching, asking people questions, getting them to answer. You can find his stuff online on YouTube. All his classes are there. Amazing guy. He wrote a book called Justice, What's the Right Thing to Do? In which he says, <clears throat> you're going to work out whether same-sex marriage is good or bad. Well, sorry. If you, you're going to work out whether same-sex marriage is a good idea or not. If you're going to work out whether there's a right to same-sex marriage, you have to start with the question, what is the point of marriage? What is marriage for? And if you've got an answer to the question, what is the good of marriage, then you can begin to ask, well, is there a right to gay marriage? Surrogacy. What are babies for? What are women's wombs for? What's the state of... You know, ask questions about the good of the creation of and the nurturing of human life in utero and then you can start answering questions about whether commercial surrogacy is, a, is right. Whether there's a right to have a baby through a surrogate or whether there isn't. If you want to take the idea about whether <coughs> the banks ought to be bailed out, you have to start with the question, what are banks for? What's the good of banking? And once you've answered the question, what's the good of banking, then you can start saying, is it the right idea for governments to bail out banks in the event of a crisis? If you're thinking about an affirmative action program to address the fact that <coughs> young black men are systematically excluded, um, just in terms of numbers, it's just the way the outcome works uh, in British universities. 
What's the point of universities? What's the public service that universities are doing? Um, why is it that we have so few young black men? Is it because they're concentrated in areas where there are all sorts of other disadvantages? You could start, you have to ask the good, what's the point? What's this for? What's it good for? Before you can get a handle on the debates. And by and large, I think politicians in Europe don't want to go any, anywhere near the question of good and bad. Which means that choice ends up filling in the space. But choice only matters if there is good and bad to choose between. Which of the five different types of bread I'm going to get in my box lunch today that I choose to eat <coughs> is a matter of indifference. It really doesn't matter. Whether I decide to eat the apple or leave the apple on one side and just stick to the candy, the chocolate that's in there. Now that's a choice that does matter because eating the apple will be good for me whereas eating the chocolate and candy will be bad. Choices are meaningful when there's something really good, really bad at stake. So, do we chuck the baby out with the bathwater? <clears throat> One, that's going to be impossible. The culture that we are in is a culture which uses the language of rights as a way of articulating its debates. And we have to engage with that. We can't simply turn up and say, I'm terribly sorry, I know that you're all speaking to us uh, using rights language, but we would prefer to communicate uh, in Mandarin. If you get to communicate, you've got to engage. But I think there is still an opportunity to say, well, the rights question is important, but let, let's just get at that by asking a question about what's good for people. Let's begin with that kind of question. And I think we can reclaim that Christian heritage uh, underlying human rights, which runs something like this. Um, human beings have worth. All members of the human species have worth. And they have that worth because we created by and loved by God. And although our worth may be diminished by our evil acts, it is never wholly forfeited. So there are certain ways you should not treat prisoners of war. There are certain ways you should not treat even those who have been convicted of the most horrendous crimes. The Americans recognise this through their idea that there shouldn't be cruel and unusual punishment. It's punishment that is strips dignity from people. And our foundation for that is Jesus. So that's the understanding of rights that Nick Waldorf argues for in his book Justice, Rights and Wrongs. He does not see rights as things that belong to individuals. He sees rights as aspects of relationships. So, my children, when they were young, had a right to be fed. Mm -hmm. But that was not a right to be fed, period. It was a right that ran something like this. My children had the right to be fed by their parents. Now, if we failed in our duty to feed our children, or maybe then some other agency would need to step in. Traditionally, that other agency would have been the auntie or the uncle. Um, I have a cousin, um, he and his first wife uh, had a daughter and the daughter was not being looked after properly. So his parents adopted their grandchild and brought her up. So her right to a decent start in life wasn't a right against the world at large. It's, it began within a context of relationships. We've actually experienced that this morning. If Fred and I turned up and said, well, it's wonderful for us to be here <coughs> in Viswa with you guys, uh, but actually we've delivered these talks that we, we're, we're due to do um, several times before, and we quite fancy doing something different. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to carry on the discussion we had about artificial intelligence last night. Apart from one person who I know has a special interest in that, the rest of you would have been justified in saying... You guys have failed in your duty towards us. 
because we came with the deal that runs something like this, we'll keep quiet <laughs> and no, smile and nod and wave. So long as you stick, broadly speaking, to the title and make as much effort as you can to be interesting. Now, that's not a right you have against air. The speakers in the other rooms, on the other tracks, you don't have that right against them. But you sign up for this one, which has created a, a relationship. And that's where our rights are embedded. And of course, they're not the most important thing about relationships. Yeah. If Fred and I had come along going, what we're going to do is we're just going to concentrate on the rights of our audience to have uh, a talk that sticks to the subject. And we could have satisfied that right by delivering something that was as boring and plain and uh, didn't involve Fred staying up till late last night changing his PowerPoint slides at the last minute. I'm sorry for interrupting him and making him do that. Um, we didn't come along going, we just want to deliver something. We came along and said, well, we want to love you by doing the best that we can. Delivering on more than rights rather than being stuck. If you have um, two three-year-olds in a room and you give one of them a bicycle, what's the other one say? Not fair. Not fair, absolutely, Pablo. It's not fair. You see, the thing is, we don't need to sit three-year-olds down with a curriculum in kindergarten to explain to them their rights. The right to an equal share comes pretty naturally to a three-year-old. It's not fair. It's my turn. We do sit people down in kindergarten and take them through actually you need to get off the bike now because somebody else needs a turn. Just because you can get to the slide faster doesn't mean that you always get the first turn and you can hog it all. Just because you get to the cake faster. Yeah. We, we have to teach people their social responsibilities. And God knows that. That's why he gave the Israelites a declaration of their responsibilities. Kennedy, US President. Ask not what your country can do for you. That's him butting straight up against Thomas Paine. Ask what you can do for your country. And then from the other side of the world, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, um, great writer, survivor of Stalin's gulags. 41 years ago, saying the defense of individual rights has reached such extremes as to make society as a whole defenseless, it is time to defend not so much human rights as human obligations. I'm not sure the West was listening when he said that. So that gives us, as Christians, a very different kind of way of thinking. I want to endorse the idea of rights. Rights are an important way of making sure that we pay attention to those who have been victimised, those who have suffered genuinely, those who aren't getting a fair deal. But we need to place our understanding of rights in a context where we start with responsibilities. We prioritise relationships and we make sure that we don't end up in a trap of discussing the idea of rights without also talking about the idea of the good.